My name is Goddex Nora Felix, and my pronouns are they, them, she, him. And I am here to give you history about queerness and transness in pre-colonial African society and diaspora. There is this Ghanaian Indian Grist symbol called Sankofa. And Sankofa means to look back, to remember where you came from, so you can feel secure and know who you are in the present. This video might be a little bit longer than the other one because it is a lot of history to cover, but I'm gonna try and do it quickly. And I urge you to go out and find out more information for yourself as there is a wealth of resources out there that speak on this history. So just to begin, we can talk about ancient Egypt. And even in the media today, ancient Egyptian figures who were prominent like pharaohs and queens are still depicted as white folks but we know from history and from drawings that they were not. When you look at this society you see already lots of aspects of amazing queerness from what was drawn on the tombs and the temples and also what was depicted on papyrus. In a tomb dated back from 2400 BC, you find this tomb of these two manicurists, Niankanum and Kumhotep, who are said to be lovers because they were found in their tomb in a lover's embrace. And many deities in ancient Egypt were portrayed as androgynous, such as the god of motherhood named Mut and Sekhmet, the god of war. Often these are depicted as women with erected penises. There are texts that even show that women lived liberal sexual lifestyles where they practice polyamory, polyandry, bisexuality. There's this tale of Horus and Set who are battling over the kingdom of Egypt in the 16th century. And this was following the death of Osiris. And after many years, Set changes his tactic and he tells Horus, hey boo, you got a beautiful thick ass and nice thighs. <laughs> hey boo. Listen, you got a nice butt, you got some nice thighs. What do you say we go in the bed where we do some, 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 some? Now, Set did something that was very unconsensual to Horace, but Horace got back at him, which does not level the playing field. But that's what happened. And there's also a tale from the Middle Kingdom about a king who has this love affair with the general. And it's likely Pepe too, who was most likely gay. Now, the story of Pepe the second is that he climbs up the ladder into his general Sassanet's house and he's there for four hours and they're just knocking boots. He does whatever his heart desires with his general. And then we can move on to the 16th century in Angola. Amongst the Imbangala people, the men had other folks that they would sleep with who were considered to be men in women's apparel. And my favorite, you have the Yoruba and Igbo people of Nigeria who did not assign a gender at birth and instead waited later in life. The Dagaba people of what's now modern day Ghana, they also did not assign genders of their children at birth and instead waited to see what energy the child had. And when we head over down to Southern Ethiopia, you see that there are trans women who will actually have the pronoun they. Within the Zimbabwe and Bushman community, there were no words to describe homosexuality. And by there being no word to actually describe homosexuality, it could neither be condemned nor praised. In fact, you even see references to queer sexualities and queer interactions in Bushman artwork. In the Siwa Oasis, it was known that the Siwan people were fine with any gender relation <laughs> and anthropologists noted that the seawood men would kill over another boy but never a woman now in the new kingdom of egypt which was known for its amazing prosperity and development in the 18th dynasty of tutmosid there was this amazing human being named hatshepsut and her pronouns were also they, them, she, him. It's amazing because when you look at Hatshepsut from a queer perspective, you see that she had all of this regalia of a non-binary king queen. When he was born, they were already ordained by their father to be uh, God's wife, meaning that they were going to be destined to be queen because they were in the pure 
bloodline. But as tragedy struck, it began that they had to actually raise the person who was going to be next in line to be Pharaoh. Now, in the early years of her as Pharaoh, she did use titles such as King's Chief's Wife or God's Wife, these feminine titles. And she depicted herself in subordinate positions, maybe beside or behind the boy king. But as she began to become more confident in her power, she began depicting herself in more powerful positions. She never attempted a coup and she never attempted an assassination. She simply solidified her power based on merit. She had representatives go all over Egypt to speak about her greatness that they themselves witnessed. She informed her people that she was actually chosen by Amun, who also is this intersex god who was able to populate the entire planet just by himself and create like the earth, the wind. This is the creator god Amun. Hashepsu was an amazing trader. And as I said before, she had contributed to one of the prosperous, most thriving times in Egypt. She had an amazing military strategy. She was so well learned, it is thought that she spoke up to 11 languages. She led a trading expedition to Punt, which is now modern day Eritrea, Sudan, or Somalia. She was able to complete this and accomplish this task and brought to Egypt incense myrrh, ebony, ivory, cinnamon wood, and electrum. This had only been accomplished by those who were truly ordained by the gods to be Pharaoh. They carved their story into gigantic obelisks. To erect an obelisk back in that time was a great feat. And Hashepsut, she had one of the highest obelisk in the world. And normally when you erect an obelisk, you erect one. Well, this bitch had two, okay, in her name. And she put an electrum on the top of them. So when the sun hit it the right way, it would just blaze and shine throughout Egypt. So Deir El Bari is a complex of mortuary temples, which is located on the west of the Nile. The most compelling complex of the Deir El Bari is Hashepsu's temple, which she finessed during her period. Within this temple, there were various depictions of her in various forms. As she was coming into her pharaohhood, she dressed with a masculine crown and a very feminine gown. So by this, you see that she takes on both masculine and feminine representations of herself and expressions of herself. And then you see as he becomes into pharaohhood that all of the depictions of him being in this feminine form, she now is completely masculinized and presents completely as male. And yet when you look at the cartouches, she is still referencing herself in combination pronouns using she and them, and also he. And this is ancient Egypt, y'all. And tell me why people are trying to act like they, them pronouns are brand new. Even the variance of her skin color was used to communicate her complex relationship with gender. She was buried alongside her father in the Valley of the Kings. As patriarchy would have it, when they discovered Hashepspa, they thought that oh wow, this is a woman pharaoh? They called her one of the most vilest type of usurpers and they believe that she attained her role through scamming, bribery, and cunning. It was said that Lil Tut Moses III destroyed all of the legacy of her being present in that dynasty to seek out revenge for her usurping his role. But it is actually known to be quite the opposite. It is discovered that Hashepsut sent Tutmosis III to different regions of Africa to learn and to gain military strategy and to form elite connections with folks. So the reason that he became such an amazing strategist and became such a well-learned individual is because of Heshepsu. When Heshepsu died, Tut Moses or maybe even his son destroyed all traces that Heshepsu even existed. She had pure royal blood while Tut Moses III was half royal blood as he was born as a result from Tut Moses, the one that dirty with one of his uh, sister wives. And it was fine in Egypt. Also, Hashepsu also was doing her thing too. He wanted to destroy all of that or his son wanted to destroy all of that so it looked like he had the throne legitimately. And so with all of this information, I hope that you all gather that queerness and transness is not something new and it is not something that is abnormal. 
and that you can find a wealth of this representation as completely normal in pre-colonial African and African diasporic society. And even in present day, you have an example of the sister girls and the brother boys of the Tiwi Islands, which is about 80 kilometers off the mainland of Australia, who are just living there and thriving. One of the elders said that when you see a sister girl, you look directly at her and you face her and you give her the respect that she deserves because she is our children.